Many people believe that trees take in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, and that forests consequently perform a vital function for the planet. It is not true. If every forest were to be chopped down, there would still be plenty of oxygen to breathe. That rather marvellous quote that starts this video off is from Mr. Simon Webb of History Debunk from yesterday, where he talks about how kids are thought that forests are the lungs of the planet. As usual, when Simon talks about science, the urge to bang your head repeatedly on a wall overcomes you very suddenly. I'm going to read a small section of a rather well-known book by the author of the Discworld novel, Sir Terry Pratchett. Sir Terry wrote this book in collaboration with a number of famous scientists. They wanted to get across the fact that a lot of what we do think about science is, well, I'll be frank, absolute bollocks. We're thinking of simplified versions of a much more complicated reality. In that respect, Simon perhaps has a point. However, Simon is trying to talk well above his pay grade on science, which he doesn't really understand, and which he just sticks a link up to from an esteemed educational establishment to try and bamboozle people. And we all notice he never actually sticks up the full versions of the documents he puts up. He also puts up documents which require access to university databases to pull up half the time where they have DOI links or they're on databases like JSTOR. Anyway, here's what I want to read from Terry. A special magic kind of magic is one of the many things that have made humans what they are. It's called education. It's how we pass on ideas from one generation to the next. If we were like computers, we'd be able to copy our minds into our children so that we would grow up agreeing with every opinion that we hold dear. Well, actually, they wouldn't, though they may start out that way. Well done there, the writers, the implicit recognition of the fact that data corrupts. There is an aspect of education we want to draw to your attention. We call it lies to children. We're aware that some readers may object to the word lie. It got Ian and Jack into terrible trouble with some literally minded Swedes at a scientific conference who took it all terribly seriously and spent several days protesting that it's not a lie. It is. It is for the best possible reasons, but it is still a lie. A lie to children is a statement that false, is false, but which none, nevertheless leads the child's minds towards a more accurate explanation, one that the child will only be able to appreciate if it has been primed with a lie. The early stages of education have to include a lot of lies to children because early explanations have to be simple. Not much point talking about the theory of relativity to a two-year-old while you give it a Farley's Rusk or something, is there, Simon? However, we live in a complex world, and lies to children must eventually be replaced by more complex stories if they are not to become delayed action genuine lies. Unfortunately, what most of us know about science consists of vaguely remembered lies to children. For example, the rainbow. We all remember being told at school that glass and water split light into constituents' colours. There's even a nice experiment where you can see them. And we were told this is how rainbows form from light passing through raindrops, I'm sure. All of us have done something like this at school, had a pr got a prism out, split it into the constituent colours and so on. When we're children, it never occurred to us that while this explains the colours of the rainbow, it doesn't explain its shape. Neither does it explain how the light from the many different raindrops in a thunder shower somehow combines to create a big arc. Terry and his collaborators then go on to point out some other great famous examples we'll all remember to school such as the idea that the Earth's magnetic field is like a huge bar magnet, or the view of the atom as a miniature solar system, or the idea that a living amoeba is a billion-year-old primitive organism, etc., etc. Now, Simon has gone on about what kids are actually thought at school. It would probably be a good idea, Simon, had you gone and looked that up. In a moment, I'm going to show you what kids are actually thought using key stage materials and what they thought about the carbon cycle today. And after that, we're going to look at the extended version of links to documents you stick up from esteemed educational institutes, which you are sticking up, surely to show how wondrously clever you are, and not, I would argue, to educate people or to elucidate. Anyway, let's end this section, and we'll go, now get on to the carbon cycle. 
Here's the carbon cycle. This is revision material the BBC publishes for kids. It's from Edexcel, so anyone who wants to argue it's not official can go off and buy a, a, a textbook and they'll find, oh yes it is. The carbon cycle. The carbon is an essential element for life. Earths and parts of each of the cells in our bodies are made from it. The carbon cycle shows how atoms of this element can exist within different compounds at different times. And let's get on to the next bit. <sighs> removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Green plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by photosynthesis. The carbon becomes part of complex molecules such as proteins, fats and carbohydrates in the plants. Returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Organisms return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by respiration. It is not just animals that respire. Plants and microorganisms do too. Even Simon Webb does occasionally. Carbon dioxide is also released by combustion. The burning of fossil fuel releases large quantities into the atmosphere, passing carbon from one organism to the next. When an animal eats a plant, carbon from the plant becomes part of the fats and proteins of the animals. Decomposers and some animals called detrivores feed on waste materials from animals and remains of dead animals and plants. The carbon then becomes part of these organisms. This then goes on at length to go on about the carbon cycle and to how it works. At no point will you find silly phrases like the forest is the land of the world or simplified rubbish like this as preached by si Professor Simon Webb, PhD, Unseen University. <laughs> Simon, please look up stuff if you're talking about it. You do tend to talk about scientific material, which is way above your pay grade. A lot of it's way above mine as well. But the difference between you and me is I'll at least go and look it up and find out about it. You know very well, much of your audience won't. And you stick up these links and you'll get loads of comments going, Yeah, great. I never knew that. Oh, thanks for telling us that. The truth has been revealed, and so forth. Stop doing it, Simon. You have a captive audience of people, of many of whom are not very well educated, whom you are annoy uh, annoyingly preaching simplified rubbish to. It's onerous to listen to. The, uh, it annoys me at a really personal level. The goal of anyone with it, an education should be to try and help other people raise their knowledge of a subject, not preach simplified versions of it and reductionist pieces of silliness. Right, having said that and got rather impassioned, and I'll admit it, I'm now going to go and open the link to the rather lengthy document at the bottom of one of Simon's, the link Simon gave to an abstract in his presentation. Here's the link gate Simon gave from the University of Cambridge. Of course, Simon used the University of Cambridge because it's a well-known and world-renowned institution. And if you start using links from it, you look like a proper geezer with some education and, and knowledge when you stick stuff up like that. He used this link, which is links to a doc several documents. I'm going to leave it on the screen for a minute or two, and I'll put a link to it in my own doc. Um, presentation. I'm not going to force you to listen to me read it all out, but what I'm interested in is this, Jiang M. et al. 2020, The Fate of Carbon in a Mature Forest Under Carbon Dioxide in Richmond Nature, 580, in parenthesis, 7802, pages 227 to 231, DOI, then you've got a long bloody number, and these numbers are what you get when you get DOI stuff from universities. They're a pain in the arse to deal with when you're doing referencing, and I detest them from personal use. I, I detest them in a way you cannot even imagine. In a minute, however, I'm going to go and open that. I'm going to stop this bit, and we'll, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And here is M. Jiang's... Um, article, just as a, a sort of um, a piece of amusement, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, or it stands for Pain in the Effing Arse, in my opinion. 
as they also tend to be mutable and change over time. And if and due to the rules of referencing in universities, if you use both those and a normal reference in bibliographies for universities, you tend to get penalised in some. Just just to make it that matters doubly nine. Anyway, let's read out the article title: "The Faith of Carbon in a Mature Forest Under Carbon Dioxide Enrichment." You know, it was, there's a very large number of common people have contributed to this. I'm not going to read out all of those, but let's read out the beginning of it. We'll ignore this abstract up here. You'll feel free to read that if you want later. Globally, forests act as a large carbon sink, absorbing a substantial proportion of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide to emissions. An ecosystem service that has tremendous social and economic value. Whether mature forests will remain carbon sinks into the future is of critical importance for aspirations to limit climate warming to no more than 1.5 centigrade above pre-industrial limits. Funny how Simon never read out this bit or noticed that M. Jiang has particular concerns about climate warming. Funny, isn't that? Now I'm going to scroll through some of it because the science, quite frankly, is well above my A -level, old A-level biology level stuff. Seriously far above it. Here we go. Here's a nice diagram of a, a more complicated version of the carbon cycle. You'll notice this is rather well way above the sort of version of the carbon cycle that kids get at key stage levels. Anyone in Simon's lot watching who want to put up your hands and say you understand this? Off you go then. And I'm going to keep scrolling down it. And I'll, I will read out little bits of this just for a laugh. Let's see what we can find that's... Oh, yes, here we go. This this should do for a laugh. Plus 27.2, plus or minus 29.7 gram CM, minus 2 YR, plus 1, suggesting a possible higher understory biomass turnover under East carbon dioxide 2. Smaller factors often neglected in other ecosystem carbon budgets, such as leaf consumption by insect herbivores, followed by a massive amount of text, including loads of pluses and minuses, and I'm not sure if I'm even reading that right. Now, Simon, if you understand this stuff, which was written by a bloke who's a PhD, do let me know. I don't. I'm a PhD student, but I'm not a scientific PhD student or a STEM student. This stuff is, like, mind-boggling to me. I'm sure it's mind-boggling to 99% of your audience as well. If you're going to quote this sort of stuff, <laughs> it becomes silly because you know very well the vast majority of your audience and the vast majority of the world wouldn't have a clue what's going on in this document. PhDs in STEM subjects like biology or biochemistry are rare enough at universities. They're people with generally very, very high... IQs and very focused de levels of dedication on these subjects. You are not in a position to understand this material, Simon, and pretending you are and trying to play reductionist games of reducing such complex material to throwaway phrases is mind-bogglingly stupid. It's ridiculous to watch you giving out scientific advice like this of a particularly dull and th banal type. I hope this presentation has showed why when Simon does this, it's so annoying. I'm going to scroll through this document and you can read out a little bit more of it. And you'll get an idea of the complexity of it yet again. Oh, look, here we are. A, ni a nice sort of bit of a algebra up on the screen where someone is doing what's probably a biomass sort of equation. That's about as far as my own science knowledge will take me with it. No further. And another one, net ecosystem. What seems to be another great string of equations. The only person I know who could make sense of that is my brother-in-law. 
who has a, a degree in a related subject, and even he'd struggle because it's a related field, not the same field. He, if he tried to explain stuff like this to me, my mind would probably melt. <sighs> We've had you do science several times recently, Simon, and you're really not in a place to do it. I'd back off on it if I were you. <sighs> 